Welcome to the Artful Teaching Podcast. I will be your host today. I am Heather Francis. Kelly Fox will not be joining us, but I have another guest joining us today. Her name is Alyssa Escalante Dixon, and she is one of the newest team members of the BYU Arts Partnership. She is one of our program coordinators, so I'll have her introduce herself in a moment. But the purpose of this episode today is to discuss the differences between action research and self study research. And actually, differences, mm, that's a little soft because self study is actually a sub form of action research. So there's quite a bit of overlap. So we're going to just talk about the differences as far as we can, granted that they're fairly similar. So I wanted to invite Alyssa to join me today because she is studying action research. She has a plan to do some in the fall. Um, She's been a classroom teacher for the past five years. And she's going to talk about action research. And I'm going to talk about self-study because I am a huge fan of self-study. And I have to set that up right here at the beginning. My bias is towards self-study. But because self-study is action research, I'm also an action research fan. So Alyssa, welcome to the podcast. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and then tell us what action research is to you. Thank you, Heather. I'm happy to be here. Like she said, I am Alyssa Escalante Dixon. I am the newest team member to the BYU Arts Partnership team. Um, And I have been in education for about 10 years, but the last five years I have been teaching as um, a licensed fifth grade teacher. I've primarily been working in a bilingual charter school that focuses uh, on the Latino community. So 94% Latino population with over 50% English language learners. And so I have such a passion for um, integrating the arts and using that to help specifically English language learners and all students to embrace and celebrate their cultures and who they are. Um, So I really loved doing that in my classroom. Right now I am studying at Utah Valley University, getting my master's degree in teacher leadership. And I uh, have the opportunity to be conducting my own action research this fall. So I don't consider myself a true expert on it, but I am uh, learning and I'm loving it and I'm excited to do my own action research this fall. Um, And to me, action research is really just a more structured and effective way of doing what great teachers are already doing in their classroom. It's just an opportunity for them to reflect on and improve upon their practice by being a little bit more specific, by really identifying a problem and going through the steps so that they can find solutions that will work in their classroom. I think when teachers think of research, they often think of big studies, they think of theories and um, you know having huge sample sizes, but The great thing about action research is you can do it right there in your classroom. It's meant to be immediately applicable to you and your students and their needs. And it's really just about improving your own practice and pedagogy as a teacher. So Alyssa, give us some examples of what action research looks like. So in my mind, action research should always start with a problem that a teacher wants to improve upon in their classroom. So for example, a kindergarten teacher noticed that her students lacked self-efficacy. They didn't believe that they could do the things that they were being asked to do. They lacked confidence. And so she decided to do action research using digital portfolios in order to create a culture of self-efficacy in the classroom. And then she also implemented that uh, in having student-led parent-teacher conferences so that then that would also transfer to that relationship with their parents and hope that it would then carry on at home as well. So that's an example of identifying a problem and using action research to find a solution. Another example might be a teacher who noticed her students who were struggling with communication skills. And so using improvisational drama activities to build those communication skills and documenting that. And that was her action research to see how effective those strategies were. So in both those examples the teacher identified the problem mm-hmm. in their in their classroom and then they chose an intervention to solve that problem correct and then they looked deeply at that intervention how it was implemented what kind of impact it had on the students what resulted from that intervention to determine if it was effective or not Exactly. And it doesn't always end up being effective, but action research is cyclical. And so it should be bringing them back to another question. Okay, if this was effective, 
why was it effective? How could it be more effective? If it wasn't effective, why wasn't it? And so then it can lead them to another question and they can continue researching and they can continue improving. Awesome. Do you have another example? Um, sure. And it doesn't need to be big. It can be something as simple as maybe you are having a problem with communication with your parents. You just don't feel like there's um, a lot of involvement or response. And so maybe you're going to do an action research project on researching different mediums and resources and using those to determine which type of communications are best between yourself and the parents at your school to get them to participate and be involved more. And then you can share that with your PLC and other teachers at your school. It doesn't need to be something large and grandiose. It can be a real problem and a real solution that's going to work for you no matter what that looks like. Yes. So especially with our arts integration endorsement program, doing a research project is an assignment. And sometimes the assignments feel like a hoop to jump through. But if it's really focused on your problems, it's it's not just a hoop to jump through. It's hopefully helping you solve a problem that you have that's not just a hoop. It's like you have to solve this problem for students to learn or to um, not burn out from your job or whatever the goal is. So what's your plan for your action research? this fall. Okay. Well, like I said, I work primarily with English language learners. Last year I had 54% English language learners, and it's really a unique experience teaching at a bilingual school because everyone is a language learner. They're either learning English as a second language or Spanish as a second language. Um, And so I was focusing on the fact that a lot of my students who are English language learners can learn the new English vocabulary that we're learning in our language arts curriculum but they're not retaining it as well as my native English speakers. And so I am going to be using drama strategies for language acquisition to hopefully increase those retention rates. Because I took this position with the BYU Arts Partnership, I don't have my own classroom, but thankfully I have some very close friends who are still at this school. I'm going to be going into um, my dear friend Luisa's classroom who teaches third grade and be implementing my action research there. That's awesome. Oh, I'm so glad that you get to work for us and be in the classroom. Yes. And um, test those things out. Even though I've taken, I've worked for the BYU Arts Partnership for four years, I every year go back into the classroom and try some new things because it's one thing to, to research my practice like from the past. Like I've taken out old files and old student work to research, you know, how I did the integrated dance and mathematics. But being able to like go and test the cyclical new version Mm -hmm. is so fun. And so. Well, and I think it's really important for us who are working with teachers to stay in the classroom, stay connected, be aware of some of the challenges they're facing and not being full time teachers. Of course, maybe we don't understand it to a full extent, but just being in their shoes and knowing, you know, what they're going through to make sure that we can really connect with them. Yes. Oh, yes. You just empathized so beautifully. (laughs) I'm so glad you brought that to the table, too. Any advice you would give teachers who are going to choose to do action research for their project? Yeah, of course. I think um, it is important to think about your question because really action research is answering a question. So you're identifying a problem, but then you need to create a question about that, how you're going to solve it. And it's okay to start with a broader, more general question, but then it's important to get more specific, narrow it down, because you don't want your action research project to be huge and unmanageable, and you want to be able to answer the question. And so maybe you are going to try to narrow down your question to something more like, what is the effect of drama integration with conflict resolution on student social skills, as opposed to something really broad like, how does drama affect social emotional learning, right? Or something broad like that. You want to be more specific. So can I give you a broad question and you make it more specific for me? I can try. Let's try. How can music help students with different abilities learn to work together? Okay, so with that, maybe teachers would want to think about which groups am I working with? Am I talking about when they are in these specific types of collaboration groups um, working on project-based learning, right? And then you also are looking at what kind of music, in what aspect are you looking 
to use the music? Is it to help with transition? Is it to help them focus more? Is it to decrease conflict and increase collaboration? And so it's just important that the teachers are getting a little more specific with what the problem is and what the strategy is that they are going to be using to help solve that problem. Right. So in this example, when you say strategy. Music is a strategy, but man, are there a plethora of musical strategies. So it could be a focus on developing beat or learning about rhythm, or it could be um, vocalization or, you know, tuning sound or playing instruments. There could be a lot of different musical strategies that would be looked at in the action research then rather than just the broad concept of music, because that's exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think it's important to remember that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You don't need to create something totally new. What you might want to do is test other experts' theories. And your question might be, does this work with my students? Um, for example, my project that I'm doing this fall, I am looking at the drama strategies that have already been tested to improve language acquisition. And I'm looking at some of these strategies that have already been used in research to specifically help English language learners. And then I'm just taking those and I'm saying, do they work with my students in my population? And is it effective for them to combine these different strategies? That's great, yeah. And in our arts integration endorsement program, we have lots of strategies and theories and practices that we've shared that you could take into the classroom and just say, does this work for me. So Mm -hmm. one of our presenters, like Teresa Love, who's one of our drama specialists, she could come and teach a lesson and you could simply ask, if I teach this lesson in my classroom, does it impact the students in this way? And take that. That's great advice. So yeah, you don't have to create anything new. You can use something you learned in our program. Yep. So that would probably be just my biggest advice is be specific with your questions. Start small and let that lead you to bigger questions later on and make sure you're not reinventing the wheel. Use other experts' theories and see if that works for you and your students. I love that. Yes, and start small. It is only a semester-long project for this course, so we do have to keep reminding ourselves to keep it smaller because the more we get into the arts, the more we dream big and we see so many possibilities and we diverge and it's wonderful and beautiful. And in a project like this, we have to really converge and say, this is the plan, this is the scope, and this is what I want to do. Stay focused on this. And then later on, you can can dig deeper. I'm going to move into how self-study is unique as a form of action research and why it's my favorite. Not that action research that you just described wasn't wonderful. I just... Self-study is novel and new to me, and I'm really excited about it. So self-study is really about studying yourself. It's in the title. And I love inspiring teachers to study themselves because I think teachers know things that if we could just pull out what they know, we could benefit all of humankind. Like teachers just have knowledge and information that if we could just uncover it and share it, humankind would be better. But I've been one of those teachers who, you know, did something in my classroom. Someone saw it. They said, wow, how'd you do that? And I'm like, I don't know. I just did it. (laughs) And I'm like, how helpful am I? (laughs) But, you know, I truly believe that I had something in my head that designed this learning experience that was actually really cool. And I can't say how I did it. And I watch other teachers do amazing things. And I'm like, how did you do it? And then they tell me, well, I don't know. And I'm like, yes, you do. (laughs) want to know because it's amazing and the things that I've learned from teachers when they say I do this and I know I do it well because of this is really impactful for me so self-study studying yourself action research you're studying the interventions the the things that you do to solve the problems and in self-study you still probably have a problem but you're going to study yourself to see how you're addressing the problem, if it's effective, and what you're doing. It's very much about your perspectives, your beliefs, your feelings, your opinions, your actions, your behaviors. You're just really the subject of the research. So one time that I was asked in my classroom, how did you do that, was when I had a student teacher in my classroom who was also hired as a paraeducation aide in the classroom. She was studying to be a mathematics teacher. She was in my eighth grade mathematics class. We were in the dance studio, and I had the students lined up in lines of four or five across the room. So 
think of an array with 20 kids, four lines, five, five kids in each line. And I'd set up this scenario where they were elves in Santa's workshop. Yes, this is eighth grade. Yes, it was a hit. <laughs> it was Christmas time. They're elves and they have to work on an assembly line to get the presents to Santa's sleigh. But they all have a different pattern in which they work through the assembly line. And what we were studying was systems of equations, which have a constant and a variable. And so what varied was the amount of time that they had to pass the gift to the next person in the assembly line. One line could pass. I put on some music and one line could pass every beat. Pass, 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 pass. Another line had to pass every two. Pass, pass pass, pass, and another group had to pass every three, and so on. So they all had a different variable of time, but the constant was that they were all starting with the first elf in line. So they got to experience this activity, and I was trying to show them, help them feel and experience this logical pattern that was related to systems of equations. You know, y equals mx plus b and how they relate to each other as constants and variables in relation to each other. And it was during this activity that my paraeducator came up to me and she's like, how did you come up with this activity? And that's when I was stumped. I'm like, I literally don't know. I just did it. And you know, kids are (laughs) behaving strangely. (laughs) I won't say badly. (laughs) Strangely. And the music's going and I'm pausing and starting and pausing and stopping and giving instructions. So it also wasn't a great time to answer the question. But if I had done a self-study on myself and looked at this intervention or like, not even the intervention, I didn't want to look at the intervention. If I could say, how do I design dance integrated math activities? I probably could have had a quick answer for her. Self-study is there so that you can say, this is what I do and this is why I know what I do and this is how I know that it works or how I know that it doesn't work and how I changed it so that it could be more impactful. So in this story, in this example, The focus of my study wasn't the activity. It wasn't how does using this scenario in Santa's workshop (laughs) help eighth grade students, you know, understand systems equations. It was how do I, as a teacher, design movement experiences to assist with mathematical learning? The focus was on me as a designer, as an artist, as a dancer, as an educator, as a creator. I'm a dancer who designs learning experiences. I can now articulate that I design everything with the body in mind. I design math activities so that students move to learn, meaning they kinesthetically experience logical patterns that they can then relate to the pencil and paper processes required to communicate through the common language of mathematics. I like to think of self-study as doing kind of the branding work required to become a teacher influencer. So do you follow teachers on social media? Alyssa, do you follow any teachers? Just a couple. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about them. Well, uh, the teacher who won Teacher of the Year a couple of years ago, I heard him speak at the Title I conference and he was amazing. And so I follow him. I am not. Oh, and then there are a couple of fifth grade teachers um, and fifth grade Facebook pages um, that I like to follow and see their design ideas and how they organize and how they're doing literacy with their students. I I'm not a big social media user though. And so I'm sure there are so many more out there that are so wonderful. But the few that I do follow um, are always so fun to see their ideas and so inspiring. Yeah. And even not being a big social media user, you know there are teacher influencers and you follow them because you value what they put out, right? Yes. So, and teacher influencers that I follow, and I'm a huge social media fan. I love it. They all have the thing, they know what they're good at and they know how to share it. I can only imagine that teachers who are really going from like being an instructional practitioner in the classroom to being an influencer of many teachers, they know themselves. They've studied themselves. I assume they've done self-study to know exactly what they do well and how to share it. So I follow some that like they're really good with the drama practices. Oh, I should share with you because you're doing that project. Yes, please do. There's one called at drama for littles. I think she's one of our specialists. So Um, But there's some teachers who are really good at classroom management. They're good at building centers. Other teachers, you know, focused in different art forms or maybe a science specialist teacher or maybe a teacher who's really great at putting up exhibits in the hallway. So, you know, different teachers have different things that they really excel in and they want to share it. So they know what they're all about. 
when you do a self-study, that's what you learn. You learn what you're all about and what's effective. And then you're able to articulate that really concisely, just like really good teacher influencers on social media. They can say in a couple words, like, this is what I do. This is my passion. This is my expertise. So I'm not promoting that everybody become a, you know, social media god or goddess with thousands of followers. Um, But I do think that through self-study, through action research, we can go from instructional practitioners to influencing others for better teaching practice. And that by pursuing rigorous study of yourself, while it might be uncomfortable, can be so expansive. It can make you feel so full and help you just appreciate yourself more and to help others see and appreciate you more too. If that's what you're into, maybe you don't need appreciation, but it really, I think, motivates teachers. Right. And it's not necessarily just about them appreciating you, but appreciating what you've been able to do for your students. And then they're able to take that to their students. And I think that's why teachers love sharing with others is because they care about children. They care about their educational experience and they want to influence and affect as many children as they can, not just within the walls of their own classroom. They want it to go beyond. When they see something that works, they want to share that so that many more students can benefit from it. Yes. And often we know that because we gleaned information from teachers who've gone before us that changed us. And we want to just repay that, pay it forward, right? Exactly. So, okay, self-study from instruction to influence, studying yourself. Here's a couple sample questions for self-study. And again, it's focused on, I'm going to use the pronoun I because it's about me. How do I advocate for arts integration in my school? Or taking Alyssa's advice more specifically, how do I advocate for arts integration to my grade level team? Or how do I advocate for arts integration through hallway displays at my school? Um, Another question could be, how do I take care of myself in a demanding profession? Or more specifically, how do I calm myself down when emotions run high in the classroom? Have you ever journaled every day about tense emotions in the classroom and then studied those journal entries? Like, whoa, that would be enlightening for me. Another question, how do I use watercolor techniques to help students explore igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rock? I know a teacher in one of our cohorts has done that in the past. It was awesome. How do I communicate about the inclusion of the arts in my classroom with my students' parents? Or you could be more specific about, you know, different um, stakeholders who want to know why you're including the arts in your classroom. Uh, Another question, how does my belief about classroom management impact student attitudes in my classroom? Interesting question, how would you document and collect data on your classroom management or your beliefs about classroom management? Well, you could write five or six journal entries about my top 10 beliefs about classroom management and just unpack it in a journal entry and share it with a critical friend every week let them respond to it and then maybe take some video of yourself to see if like you're really acting out those beliefs and test that information against your journal entries against what your critical friend is saying to come up with conclusions what what does your belief about classroom management really do to the attitudes in your in your students room maybe it doesn't affect them at all so self-study is not research about the intervention it's Um, An intervention question or an action research question might be, will the use of song lyrics improve my students' recall of multiplication facts? You could do a pre and post, you know, math fact student test. If I was to do it as a self-study, I would say probably, what do I know about using song lyrics to improve student recall of multiplication math facts? Or how do I select music for the classroom to assist students to recall math facts? So it's about how you engage with that idea rather than if the idea works for all students. So that's self-study. It's action research, but it's just focused on you as the teacher. And um, I love to see teachers focus on themselves. And I think, you know, that that element of significance, being a significant teacher, some teachers work behind closed doors and a lot of people don't see what they do. You can go, you know, days without anyone knowing what you did during your week with the, with the students. (laughs) And That's kind of scary to say, but actually it's just if we study ourselves and then we share what we know and what we do, we can we can expand past that classroom door and we can share what we're doing and what works and, and have influence beyond just the students in our classroom who are our main stewardship. But we want to improve, you know, education everywhere for all children because all children are worthwhile and valuable to us and they're our future. And so this this systematic 
inquiry is going to be so important and so hopefully beneficial for everyone who participates in it this semester. Okay, so that concludes episode two. In episode three, I think we'll go into a couple more examples from past teachers and what they have accomplished through self-study and action research, just to prime the pump and get you brainstorming about what you want to do for your project this semester. Thank you for joining us on the Artful Teaching Podcast. We're glad you're here. If you're looking for more resources to deepen student learning and improve your classroom culture, go to advancingartsleadership.com and find lots of resources there. They're all open and free for you to use. And if ever you have questions or feedback for us, please reach out at artspartnership at byu.edu. Have an artful day. Mm -hmm.